Uh, I should warn you now, there might be a little bit of graphic content in this, so if you are squeamish about that, I'll tell you to look away. And if you like graphic content, you'll probably be disappointed because it's not, <laughs> it's not that graphic. All right, who am I? Uh, local yokel here, been here um, about 16 years. Uh, Bellingham Codes member, graduated from Western uh, and Cellular um, Biology. I'm a software engineer here in town at Emergency Reporting. Instruct here at BTC on occasion. Father, biker, maker, hacker, sometimes at the same time. Uh, the first thing I want to lay out is what is the difference between RFID and NFC? Um, RFID is radio frequency identification, and it's typically just a number. It's just a key that's unique to every RFID chip. That's, that's all it is. And um, RFID is typically passive. So with implants, there's no battery, there's no charge. <coughs> the way you read from it is to have an antenna that broadcasts that radio signal a coil in the chip will absorb that signal. It'll couple with that. That'll power the chip and reflect the signal back with your code. So uh, first concern people have is, aren't you radiating? And No, it's you, you reflect radio signal, but it goes through a chip first that modifies that signal. Uh, NFC, on the other hand, uh, is typically powered. Um, and... <coughs> You all have it on your phones, I'm sure, unless someone here still have a flip phone. Yep, one every Linux <laughs> fest. Uh, it's a badge of honor. Uh, so NFC is typically used for, for more data transfer. RFID will have a static ID in it. NFC, you can change the data that you, you transmit. So remember the old phone commercials where people bump phones together and share contacts, and we never did it? <laughs> or more, more recently, a tap to pay. I love tap to pay because I always have my phone. I don't always have my wallet. Um, other than that, frequency ranges, RFID uh, <coughs> usually is in the 13.56 megahertz, but there are some more secure applications in lower ranges and, and other fitness applications in higher ranges. Uh, so something you should check before you get an implant is um, what do you want to use it for and what frequencies do those things use? You don't want to get an implant, walk into the office the next day and figure out that it doesn't work. <laughs> but you have two hands, so you could get another. That's what I'm doing. Um, that actually happened to, to me. I got one from Dangerous Things. Oh, yeah. Penguin Con a couple of years ago. And it, but I got the hobbyist one, and what I wanted to do was to, you know, get the one where I could get door locks. Yep. Well, you can get door locks with the hobbyist one, and I'll show you that too. Okay, great. Um, and yeah, I kind of already went over the uses. Um, as an identifier, RFID is making its way into mostly the retail space, so it's slowly usurping barcodes, those tedious zebra-like things on your products with, with it's something. It's already penetrated the wholesale. Yeah. In other words, if you deal with Walmart, packages all have to have an RFID chip. And it's a great step forward because um, it opens up the doors to things like, imagine going into the grocery store, bagging all your groceries as you shop, and then just pushing your cart through a little archway and it rings everything up in one pass, like you, that, that would be great. Though Amazon's jumped the shark and they're using visual recognition to, to yeah. automate that. So of course they are. Uh, all right, so if you're squeamish, uh, there's a very uninteresting wall in the back. But I'll show you the installation process. This is me about two years ago for about 15 seconds. And that's Mary from, from the foundry behind there. You can tell how exciting it is because she's yawning. <laughs> Do I? I might. 
Do I have sound? Let me see. I might not even have sound on the video. Yeah. No, we were all just that quiet. Uh, that that was at the end of a uh, hackathon here in Bellingham for Amazon Alexa skills, and one of the judges for that was Amal, who started that Dangerous Things company, and he offered up these implants, and he said, the first one to raise their hand gets it for free, and at the end I said, did anyone raise their hand? He said, no, and I said, <laughs> so, um, I should preface that though, I, I'm, I'm not sure anyone else had really even considered it before that. And if, if you hadn't had time to really consider all the implications, are you going to take that step? But I had been following people on YouTube, one, one man in particular in Australia who, uh, he had to skirt all of these local FCC-esque regulations to get his imported and, and put in, but um, he got everything in his house. Uh, tied into it. The, his car, he just taps the door, it unlocks and starts up. Um, his office, um, everything, and I just thought that was the coolest thing, so I was There's an article two years eager. ago in Wired about somebody who took a, an ID check. Oh, yeah. There's, there's an article like every week now. <laughs> it's, it's catching on. All right. They're really handy. All right. To the security implications. Uh, don't, don't, don't pen test me, bro. Um, first things are words. This is probably the actual graphic content. <laughs> Hide and seek, uh, peekaboo. Um, so I wrote here really, really in fine print, security through obscurity. Um, we're at a point right now where um, pretty much all of the other security concerns related to these chips are moot because no one even thinks that they exist or are looking for them, or if they do know they exist, the assumption is that you don't have one, just statistically speaking. So people probably aren't going to be uh, uh, checking you for that. Um, you can't hack what you can't grab, right? Uh, some statistics. So nearly 8 billion RFIDs were sold and bought last year. Um, why do I bring that up in terms of security? Uh, most of those tags, almost exclusively all of those tags, were sold for retail purposes. And if you're putting these tags into things that cost money, people will want to get those things that cost money. So uh, people are going to develop better tools and skills and methods for compromising RFID. Um, to thwart these retail applications, and some of those techniques will likely triple, trickle over to, to um, other RFID applications. Uh, permanence. So um, we're already using things like fingerprints and retinas and, and uh, voice for some security applications. Uh, my computer opens up when it sees my face. Uh, those are fairly permanent things, or at least if they're not, I, I don't want to change my face and kind of, I mean, maybe, actually, well, <laughs> we'll think about it. <laughs> but fingerprints and retinas, not, not, not so easy, right? And, and um, on the spectrum of things, in terms of permanence, this RFID chip is actually uh, relatively semi-permanent. You know, it's, it's not something that's going to be easy to remove. But it's not something that's hard either. It's just, uh, yeah, it's it's a rel it's an incision about that big, and then it just pops back out. So if you ever do need it removed, uh, your local tattoo guy <laughs> can take care of it for you and give you a nice like butterfly or something on top of it. Um, but if permanence is a concern, I highly recommend. I wrote jewelry there. Uh, Getting one of the NFC RFID rings or necklaces or one of those things and just wearing that for a while and using it as you would your implant and see if you really are, are getting what you're looking for out of that. And if you decide, you know, you like that, um, you might just decide to stick with the ring. Um, but if you're like me and you like to go swimming in Lake Patton and rings just have a habit of falling to the bottom, uh, it's it's... Uh, further down the permanent scale. 
Um, attack vectors. How are people going to get your ID? Asking nicely. Uh, the most likely at this point is direct scanning. So actually coming up and bumping you with some sort of reader, be it a phone, be it uh, the Adafruit PN532. Um, obviously, uh, you're probably going to notice if someone comes up and gives you a little like rub mm -hmm. on your hand. Um, what if they have a reader in their hand when they shake your hand? <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not, they're not that discreet yet, and I don't know if you guys can see in the back. This is actually the reader I use at home. I'll give you a little demo with it in a bit. Um, so that whole thing I said about these needing to couple, they need to magnetically, wirelessly couple with the radio <coughs> antenna, that means they have to be very close and focused. So there's a ring, there's a big ring about this big inside that, and that's the antenna broadcasting the radio signal. And um, unless my chip is pretty much almost inside that ring, it doesn't couple, and you can't read it. So um, you do have to get really close, but that doesn't mean it's not possible, right? Or maybe you do something, you could be clever, right? Like, oh, check out, like, this picture of my kid, you hand him the phone, and the phone scans it. So, I mean, yeah, you, yeah. I was gonna say other places too. You just like have a tongue implant. <laughs> yeah, just. <laughs> it's my lick lock. Next. Coming to Kickstarter. Nah, Indiegogo. Uh, Yes, so signal strength and antenna size and um, orientation has a lot to do with it. So these implants are actually kind of, they're, they're shaped like a pill. Um, it's like a big grain of rice. And the antenna is coiled up tightly uh, along the long axis inside that. So the best way to actually get a read is along the axis, the long axis of the pill which is kind of tough because uh, there's all this knuckle and stuff in between mm -hmm. there. So you, you actually develop a little bit of a, a technique to it where you just kind of come at it at this angle and then swoop, and then you'll get a brief coupling. But if you just tap it straight up like that, it oftentimes won't couple because the antenna is pointing this way. Yeah. Yeah, but what if we put, say, big a loop? few loops around this whole entire room. Oh, yeah. With, with a megawatt. <laughs> now we go bang, everybody's in here, RFID goes, okay. So it's not, the physics actually aren't quite that simple. Mm -hmm. um, the the uh, frequency know. has to be, oh, no, I realize that. Yeah, the frequency has to match. Uh, but the bigger the loop, the lower your frequency. It should be. Yeah. That's correct. I'll go with that. So you'd need a lot of tiny loops yeah, multiple around. Antennas, what I mean, like something on a massive array. Oh yeah, and you could. Transmit, we could spoke any radio from anywhere. It costs a lot of money though. They. Well, true, but, I mean, that would be you, you 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 also have this physical property where the the antenna the the strength drops off exponentially with true. distance. But as so. As long as the signal start with a megawatt, we go with then we don't care because we lost the last. You'll, prob you'll probably have some interesting side effects in that room beyond <laughs> <laughs> electronic devices may exhibit. Burritos might cook themselves. <laughs> but no, these, these uh, it's a nice lead into to the, second, the second part, indirect scanning. And this, this is a screenshot from Watch Dogs 2, um, which is a game, and uh, I believe nonfiction. But uh, the, the gun in his hand, the RFID reading gun, is, is in fact um, born of reality. Yeah. And um, rather than just focusing on having big antennas, it's focusing on having um, laser and focused radio waves antennas. So, so they can actually uh, shoot a laser that will uh, um, 
power your your antenna, and um, and then they have an array, a dish array, usually a lot bigger than the one you'd see there that can that can actually pick up the faint signal. Um, so that's a concern if you are, I don't know, far more important than me. <laughs> uh, but that technology does exist, and um, it will eventually trickle out of the CIA and into potential wrongdoer's hands. Yeah. Yeah, there is a standard right now. The guy, you, you can buy it right now with in a gun that encodes to the RFID chip. Mm -hmm. That as soon as you pick it up, you can fire. You hand it to anybody else, and it's instantly in auto lock. That's in here too. Okay. Uh, it's been done for quite a while. It's been yeah, but. Um, it's not easy to actually get a read with this gun. You, you do need the person with, uh, with the implant to stand still in a clear you know, view, and you can't be that far away. Um, so uh, you know, if you see people on rooftops with a funny looking gun chasing you, maybe just stay in motion. <laughs> or just do that to be safe. Uh, compromised readers. Uh, so this is more likely to. Um, whatever you use to scan into your building, um, if one day it looks a little different, or a little thicker, or a little fatter than usual, or has something soldered into it, <laughs> uh, just, uh, you know, don't go to work that day. <laughs> and then, um, it, it didn't really fit under attack vectors, but I wanted to call it out anyway. Um, aside from compromised readers, and, and if someone, you know, is trying to rub their phone against you, um, you can often lose your uh, RFID ID without any knowledge of having lost it through a lot of these attack vectors. And that's, that's something that's really big, right? It's one thing if, if uh, someone steals your key, but it's a bigger thing if someone steals your key and then you don't know, right? Because then you don't know to change your locks or so. Um, <coughs> Very dangerous. Um, to show off direct scanning, um, I have my phone here. Phone is set up for uh, with an NFC reader. Um, yeah. But isn't NFC better for data? Really, I mean, because RFID is simply the number. With the data, you can pass a massive information like a Wi-Fi entirely. You can do the whole thing under NFC. Yes. Hello, no. Linux Fest. There we go. <laughs> So that's kind of illustrating how hard it is to read it, even even with a modern day. This is the Pixel 2. Um, so you have to really... Hello, Linux Fest. There we go. So uh, to get that coupling, um, it's not easy. It's not easy, but it is possible. But... Uh, I should point out too, you can also have it unlock your phone for you. You can put your uh, Wi-Fi credentials on there. So when people come over, rather than asking for the Wi-Fi, you just rub their phone <laughs> and then they're on the Wi-Fi. <clears throat> Couldn't they uh, increase the security by like implanting three different chips in with different codes? Potentially, yeah, yeah. Then you your security. Confuse them a bit and maybe muddle the signal. It'd probably also confuse the readers that you're trying to use. Yeah. Uh, so mitigating this, um, there's a couple things that are important to do once you do get your uh, uh, implant. The the first and foremost, and if you buy it from Dangerous Things, they'll they'll likely point you to the app that does this. There's there's what's called a burn bit or a lock bit. And when you're given your chip, you, you can actually change any of the data on it. Um, you have the seven byte RFID code, and you're allotted 888 bytes of NFC data that you can write whatever you want, which isn't a lot, but <coughs> whatever you want. For a while, I had my website, and uh, it would go through the phone and also pick up GPS coordinates of whoever was scanning me, and it would hit my website with those GPS coordinates and the get parameters, and I would just record where I got scanned and when I got scanned. I had a little map, <laughs> just like, got scanned here. 
state on the UFC chip is um, write once? No. You can read write um, to your heart's content, to your hand's content. <laughs> on your eye, watch it, even when it's embedded, you're saying? You yes. Know, it went embedded by using a... Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I can show you that after. Uh, but uh, for your RFID, there's a burn bit, a lock bit. And um, what you'll want to do is uh, <coughs> make sure everything works. Make sure you can use the, the things that you want to use. And, and once you're sure of that, you'll want to write to that lock bit. And once you do, it will physically modify the hardware so that you can no longer change that ID. Um, and that's important because um, without that, people could potentially <clears throat> corrupt your key. They could, you know, not just read what your current key is, but they could change it. So they could have a denial of service attack, essentially. You, you could no longer get into your building. You could no longer get into your house. Yeah, but they could. Is there a way to um, remove or burn out that burn bit so that you guarantee that no one else can burn it for you if you want it to be permanently modifiable for whatever reason? Ooh. Maybe? Potentially. I don't know. I'll have to look into that. An unburn bit. And then uh, just so kind of wardrobe selection. Does just, just burn the ID or all of the, you said there's like 800 some bytes? Just the ID. Just the ID. Okay. Uh -huh. So you can change it. Uh, for NFC, you can change it. The NFC remains malleable, but your RFID ID will be locked. So, uh, yeah. Context. Um, something I want to emphasize is um, if you're worried about security and you're getting one of these implants, uh, Context is important. Um, your phone is a far larger security risk to you in terms of what it can access and what it can provide in terms of data than this chip. Um, and you have immense power over what kind of security you'll tolerate. So um, if you get this chip and all you do is tie it into your garage door to lock and unlock, then all you're risking is whatever's in your garage. If you get this chip and you use it to get into CIA headquarters, well, then security is more of a concern, right? But that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Um, I think what you want then is multi-factor authentication, right? So if you're trying to get into the CIA, you scan your hands and your eyes and your face and your phone you know, as much, as much as you need. So um, get the implant, but if you are using it for something that you're actually worried about, you're worried someone might compromise it and, and take advantage of you, add in more layers of authentication. Um, so one of the things that I look forward to is, is an ability to um, have a key on here and use that to decrypt something from my phone and then my phone will actually act as the key. So um, what the good man Amal has been working on quite a bit is, is a payment chip. And the, the chip doesn't actually do the payment. The chip actually contains an encryption key that unlocks a wallet on your phone and allows you to pay. So at that point, it's part of a multi-factor. If someone takes your phone, they can't pay with it. If someone takes your hand, they can't pay with that either. Yeah, you you just, yeah if they catch you while you're holding it, you're probably, well... You lost the cash in your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't you just make the uh -huh. chip key, the public key, and a uh, handshake? So you can mm -hmm. have your private uh, hash code, and you have that secure, and you use this as the public key portion of it. Exactly. In your uh, handshake. So. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Literal handshake. Um, okay. So this is in Wisconsin. 
It's this company called Three Square Market. Um, and you may have heard of them, um, not because they are making little micro markets, that's their business, these little miniature markets inside of, of office spaces and stuff. But you may have heard of them because um, they offered free implants to all of their employees. And 50 of their 80 employees took them up on it. And every day those employees come into work, that implant will get them in the door. It will work with all of the vending machines in the office. When they get to their computer terminal, it will log them in. And any office equipment that they need to use, like printers or copiers or, or anything like that, uh, it serves as authentication for that too. Um, you were asking about using your chip for, for door locks. The Samsung Eson, this is what is on my front door, and I have the hobbyist oh. 1356. Um, this is on the pricey side, but for my front door to my house, I want it on, my, on the pricey side. Um, it's also safer in some ways, right? With, with your traditional lock, you have keys, and if you lose a key, you have to change out the whole lock, right? And get everyone else's keys and change those, right? Um, right now, my neighbors have a key, and if all of a sudden I didn't like my neighbors, I can just remove them from the authenticated list. And they can keep the key, I don't need it. Um, so that's a commercially available product. Uh, other, other neat things that they're doing with implants beyond just RFID is they have uh, biothermal implants. So it's, it's a similar, similar style implant but smaller and it'll actually take constant uh, temperature readings in your body and they're using those uh, in the medical industry. Um, but I think it'd be really cool if, like, Alexa just told you you were having a fever <laughs> before. And then started playing, like, disco fever. Um, yeah. Is so, if you, if something happens, is there an altered way to open up that door lock? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, suppose you lose your hand. <laughs> um, well, it's more likely the chip somehow gets injured and broken. Potentially, yeah. Um, and I wanted to speak to that as well. Um, you can use a code with this. So uh, right now I have a 13-digit <coughs> code. Don't you use it so often you've already forgotten that? My four-year-old <laughs> could get in with that code. Um, yeah, but it's there, so I have a way. Um, we also have a pet door, so I mean... Our house was built in like 1895. There's there's ways in, <laughs> but but yes, there there are. Uh, you can use a code or a card. Um, I purposefully chose this too because it's not connected to the internet. There are other doors that are connected to the internet, or or via Bluetooth, and you could use an app. Um, I did not want to have anything that interacts with my chip also open to the internet, no matter the port. Um, so this is actually what I use on my garage right now. Um, it is an Arduino Uno R3, your, your standard bread and butter. It's the Adafruit uh, PN532 um, RFID shield on top of that soldered on some lights and a piezo buzzer, and that actually ties into a relay board. Oh, and one of the bad keys touched it. Um, the relay board, all a relay is, is a, a little flap of metal, and there's a little electromagnet under it, and if you put a little bit of charge through that electromagnet, it'll repulse the flap, and the flap will make contact. You, so you can take a little bit of power just a little bit of like three volts from the Arduino board and use that to turn on a switch that carries full mains voltage. So uh, the relay board is actually what triggers my electric door strike for my door. 
And if you're going to do this for your door, get the door strike and not the door push because uh, the strike actually lets you still use the door like a normal door. You can put a key in and unlock it. So I bought the fail secure electric door strike. Power goes out, doors stay locked, but I can get the key and still get in the garage. Um, I also tied this relay board into my uh, lights in the garage. So uh, as soon as you scan in and open the door, the lights turn on. And then I thought, man, I'm sick of turning the lights back off though. So I put a little hall effect sensor, it's just a magnet sensor uh, on the door frame and a magnet on the door. So when the door closes, it shuts off the lights. Um, and I believe I have a video. It means you gotta leave the door open when you're in there, right? <laughs> Yes, it does. Uh, I put some more magnets on the back of the door so the door holds itself open as you, as you come in. Um, but in the same spirit as keeping the door accessible, um, I wired in a regular switch to the lights. So if you wanted to, you could still flip the switch on um, and that would keep the lights on no matter the state of the door. <coughs> but 99% of the time I just pop open the door, lights turn on, go back to the kegerator, work on robots. <laughs> um, let's see. That's the muggle switch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. So this is my front door. I do have some. Uh, right on the face, the bottom of the face. Um, it is marked. There's a there's a faint uh, picture of a card, and then it says card on it, which amuses me because I am not a card, but I work. Um, and then this is my garage. Again, security through obscurity. That's why I haven't uh, painted my garage or made it look nice. So can't get in. <laughs> yeah, I should probably wipe the smudge. There's the electronic door strike. If there's any electricians in the house, turn your, avert your eyes. This is, this is the gore. <laughs> so when there's a power failure, everything fails secure. But you're still able to use a normal key to get in, in and out of the door. Yes, the house is battery powered. Um, so it takes four double A's, and I've had it for two years and have not had to change them. So uh, I don't know yet. <laughs> yeah, that wear mark reminds me of uh, if a keyboard's been used long enough, you can tell which keys are used for the password. Yeah. Because they wear off the top. So I actually routed out a little bit of the siding inside the door, and I mount this reader. Um, in there so I can access it through the wall. Um, and put a little Mario jingle in there, so. Um, but it also tells you how long the door is unlocked for, so when the music stops, the lock re-engages, so, so you know. Um, and then um, if you take a key that I have not programmed in, and it will actually buffer you cannot continue scanning until the timeout goes, and then that timeout logarithmically decays or exponentially increases. Mm -hmm. So uh, <coughs> if you're trying to brute force in, you, you'll, I mean, I'll come home before you get in. Yeah, and I'm, I would like to have a way to have this notify me of invalid scans. I log it. But again, it's worth more to me 
to not have this connected to the internet in any sort of way than it is to, to keep me notified while I'm at work. And plus I have all sorts of other security, like cameras and stuff in the garage. I'll get motion alarms. So. But does that desensitize when you're using the wrong key there for you with the right key? Well, if you keep doing it, somebody sits there and drives for half an hour, you come home, are you three hours away from opening the door because it's got to gun through all of its you know, oh. oh, 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 not three hours. Uh, uh, you know what I mean? That if they come and do it and you come up to yeah. it, will it not I set it for 15 minutes and it will Locked not read me, yeah, okay. so. Okay. But hasn't happened yet. Now we all know we're gonna walk right yeah, I was going to say, uh, security through obscurity, if, that, if that's what you're looking for, don't give conference talks. <laughs> uh, so, let me bring up my presenter, there we go. Uh, common misconceptions. Um, is someone going to track me? No. I mean, if, if they're able to read your chip, congratulations. They've, they've found you. They're either touching you or uh, less than a block away. So they're, congratulations, you're already tracking me. The, the chip doesn't, doesn't offer them any help. Um, I'm going to get poisoned from this. There's, there's something that this is going to, to do that will, will give me cancer or something. The FDA has approved the uh, exact materials that this ship is coated in um, for dozens of years now. These have been going into pets for tracking. Um, it's the same exact chip. Um, and that, that research just hasn't bore out. It's, it's safe. Pain, is it going to hurt? Yes. <laughs> Once. But after that, no. Um, I lift weights, I hike, I bike, I swim, I give hearty high fives, and nothing's... I even, um, so I do a lot of home renovation, um, hit the exact spot with the hammer. Uh, I, and I was terrified, I'm like, oh no, I shatter it, and it was, no, um, because thankfully the rest of me is so squishy, <laughs> nothing happened. Yeah, that was a main concern of mine, was like lifting weights or string or something. Mm-hmm. You will want to stay away from that for, for uh, a couple weeks. How long did it take for it to heal? I'd say uh, within a week it was done, fine. Does, does it uncomfortable to type? Nope. Or do you feel it? Don't even notice it okay. most of the time. Are um, there incidences of people building up scar tissue around? Yeah, uh, so there's always going to be a little bit of scarification, and that's intentional. Well, it's I mean, coated in a biopolymer that, that encourages that. Um, and that's actually what keeps it in place from migrating, you know, through your skin up into your... So... You scan like this up here now. Slide down your wrist every time. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, in terms of pain, I, I was back rock climbing in less than two weeks okay. with this, so... Um, travel. Is TSA going to uh, pat me down for having this? No. They'll pat you down, but <laughs> not for this. Uh, I just got back from Indianapolis a couple days ago, and um, not a problem. So did you get picked up at the airport when you went through the doorway? I th think one TSA agent maybe like saw something when they were looking at the screen, but the, nothing came up. They might have been looking at other things, though, you know, with the scanners these days. So, so you got the chip from somewhere. Yes. Is it recorded? Is that company? Does that company still know, or do they record, or is there a global stateside database that you have this chip? No. You have no reasonable fear that you are linked to the chip you've bought, at least if you buy it through dangerous things. Um, I can't speak for other... Other vendors, though. So dangerous things doesn't keep a record of who they sell which ID to. Right. They have bulk stock. You buy a chip. They do not know which chip. And then you change it before you fuse it off anyway. So. Yep, you can, yeah. if if that's a concern. Um. Other misconceptions. I am the antichrist. I get that a lot. <laughs> you know, I got the mark of the beast. Um, 
that's that's what it is. Uh, yeah. Is there another question? Where did you get an MRI? Right. So uh, that's been a non-issue too. Um, and dangerous things. They have additional uh, articles on all of this stuff. They have a very generous fact section with with uh, all the medical and travel and, and all those implications. So if you have a specific concern, definitely. Is it a magnetic material? I mean, that, that would be the concern with an MRI. No. So. Uh, what's coming? What's the future? So uh, you might not want to just get an implant yet because they're working on all sorts of other things that are cool. Um, they have this line of flex transponders, which, which are actually this, this paper-thin, uh, flexible material that can just be kind of put into your skin like a paper cut. Um, and then um, rather than having to have this awkward kind of thing here and doing the, the secret handshake, you have it in your fingertips. And that makes me really excited because I could have like a virtual keyboard that I, or a table that I could just type. Can you imagine just typing on a table and it knows where you're typing? Um, Laser keyboard. Yeah. Um, I already kind of went into three-factor authentication, uh, well, using it as multi-factor. And, and typically, the best security hits three things, right? And you probably know this better than I do, but um, it should hit you with something that only you know, something that only you have, and something that only you are. And because of this weird relationship I have with this chip, I satisfy the last two with it alone. Um, it's kind of catching on in pop culture. There's a whole Watch Dogs 2 mission where you have to try to re <laughs> read that chip <laughs> uh, and get things. Uh, smart guns, I think you mentioned that, yeah. So Amal has been working with, with gun manufacturers to make a gun where you have to grab it. And uh, unless it detects your chip on the handle, it will not fire. Um, but if you're a fan of DEF CON, you'll see that a strong <laughs> magnet <laughs> uh, thwarts that. They're still working out the kinks. Payments, I mentioned kind of how those work with just um, um, uh, encryption, public, private key, um, ambient computing. So that, that's what has me the most excited about the future. Just uh, smart homes now aren't smart. <laughs> They're slave homes. You walk in, you tell them what to do, right? You say, turn on the lights, and they turn on the lights. Um, I want a house where I walk in, and as I reach for the light switch before I hit it, the lights are on. The house should watch. The house should know what I want what my intent is, and it should be smart about it. It should be a butler. Um, and uh, having things like RFID implants adds more to that IO, more to that sense, more that the house can know about what's going on inside. And that's ultimately what I'm striving for. Um, if you wanted to ease into this sort of stuff, by, like having a secure pet thing for mm -hmm. No. All, um, all, most pets have a, a, a chip in their neck. Yeah. That, that's actually a common, uh, one of the things I've seen is, is you get a uh, uh, NFC RFID uh, tag for your pets, and they wear that tag. Um, and maybe you have two pets, and one of them likes to eat more than the other. <laughs> um, so you can actually set up the food dish so that it covers up. And then when one comes, it opens, and when the other comes, it co closes. And you can just say, you know, you each get five minutes <laughs> and enforce it. Um, they learn to help each other. All right, so I'm going to attempt to pick the lock that was protecting my garage while I take Q&A. Yes? What about uh, how sensitive are they to damage from electrical? Like the strong RF, damaging. Right. Um, it's that is something that can happen, but it's not something that's likely to happen unless it's it's an intentional burn. Um, you, you can actually fry the chips if if you give it enough EM at that frequency. Yeah. Yeah. So I always see in videos people always get them like right here. Mm hmm. Is there a reason for that? Um, it's because it's the most biologically convenient, so it's not going to rub up against any kind of bone or sinew. Um, it's least likely to migrate or resist scarification. 
and it's still on your hand, so you can uh, uh, use it kind of excessively with your phone and your like right here. People people do put them other places. Uh, yeah, and people. I feel like that'd be way more convenient than having them like. <laughs> yeah, people even put them in their fingertips, and that gives me kind of the heebie-jeebies. So that is how good my previous lock was on my house. And this is just a standard master lock like you'd buy here at the college store. Sorry, BTC. <laughs> uh, that's not to say that a real criminal who went in your garage would use lock picks. Uh, they'd take a bolt cutter and do it twice as fast, or a torch, or a boot. Or a chainsaw. Or go through mm -hmm. the window. Yeah. So, uh, Plus they wanted to get in and not have you know they got in. Which again, it's all about context, right? So if this is just as secure as the previous solution, but twice as convenient, then it's a win overall, right? Yeah. Yes? What do you see as the futures um, for security? Like, I'm almost thinking like RFID shielded glove or something. Mm, yeah, to protect from it, the, the Michael Jackson glove for all right. one. <laughs> Um, I think ultimately it's going to be multi-factor and I, I think it's really up to whatever security, um, whatever your tolerances are for that. So if your office really wants that door secure, you scan your RFID, but it's also looking for a signal from your phone or, or some other thing that, that um, also has to be there. So just multi-factors is probably going to be the best way to go. That's where I see the industry going, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I scare you? Yes. Well, right. try. Question. First, are you familiar with the names? AdBright, AdCash, Bing Ads, DoubleClick, Google Ads, yes? Some of them, yes. Okay. Are you familiar with, what was that? Oh, yeah, Cambridge Analytica. Oh, I've, I've heard of these people, yes. Are you familiar with the Entertainment Merchants Association? <laughs> no. Are you familiar with the Communication Security Intelligence? Not personally. Okay. Five, ten years ago, the Entertainment Merchants Association started making arrangements with the Ad uh, Association mm -hmm. to create a network of tracking. The RFID tags were mm -hmm. used to track from one store to another to determine foot traffic. Mm -hmm. It is now active, it is now mature. Now, uh, it's easy to do this kind of stuff. The communication security establishment is the Canadian equivalent of the NSA. When Snowden did his little disclosure, mm -hmm. what was also disclosed at the same time, didn't get too much press here, but it did in Canada, was that the CSC had created a project and had perfected the technology that would track cell phones across airports across the world. Didn't matter if the cell phones were active or not. Didn't matter if they were on, pinging on the networks. Yep. They tracked it. Google has their wonderful little technology for cameras, associations, face recognition, based on a lot of A database is extremely easy to use. It's easy to make associations. I think, right I, see, I, think I see where, where we're going, going with this. In the United States, there is an active market of exchanging information on the corporate side. Mm -hmm. the police uh, departments across the country, they, a lot of them, have been mandated they cannot keep databases. No, they go to the merchants and buy them. The, uh, there's a large association that tracks license plates across the country. So there, there are things you can do there. Um, and yes, in, in terms of tracking and in terms of people trying to link you to uh, a profile, that is something that, that will be a growing concern. Um, I think we're a ways off before we really see that manifesting in any significant way, at least in terms of RFID. Um, and as I said kind of earlier, your phones is many, many, many orders of magnitude. You know, if this is still in your pocket, then that's more of a concern than this in your hand. And once upon a time, it was less than a few hundred megabytes, 16 pieces of information would cover everybody in the world. But I'd love to give a whole nother talk on just how you can mess with those people. Because those, those AI algorithms that they're using, those neural networks that are trying to connect you to a profile with all your data and stuff, uh, they're not perfect. They work when you're just doing what your normal thing is, but you can, you can poison them. 
One more little piece of information. Between 2001 and 2005, Homeland Security, when they were newly created, mm -hmm. had a contract. No, I didn't follow it afterwards. They wanted a company to create an RFID tracking system that would allow them to track RFIDs mounted on vehicles moving at 60 miles an hour crossing international borders. Hmm. So that was a long time ago. I think Active or passive RFID? I'd have to ask. That seems like that have to be active to pick up that kind of signal. Um, Back in those days, I don't think they stood here. They just said they were looking at an RFID tracking system. And RF, R, what, when you're talking RFID too, it's, it is a broad category. So the frequency that you're dealing with, and also whether it's active or passive, has great impact on, on uh, signal strength, how far you can read, what you can read. Um, so with this one at the standard 13.56, uh, the range is relatively low and, and, and being course, passive. That's the last question. Have you seen minority reports? That's what I was thinking, right? Of course, when you're talking about going from store to store in the mall. Oh, Mr. Hunt, yes. Uh, no, I agree. I, there's about another five, ten years. But they're going to be using your phone for that stuff long uh, before. There's so many ways. Associated yeah. with associated so um, you mentioned dangerous things as a source for them on some of the standard um, mm -hmm. wavelengths that you talked about. Are there sources for chips on the other uh, parts of the spectrum that are like implant grade? Yes, uh, dangerous things at least has the, the two most widely used ones, the ones that you'd find for like uh, commercial security like in dollar systems and stuff. They have a chip for that and then the, the hobbyist 13.5 stick, five, six for more stuff like this. And I was actually hoping to have a chip in here and the needle and stuff to show you guys, but it hasn't come in yet um, because I'm actually going to get the other chip in my left hand. So I no longer have to, I 3D printed a case for my, uh, this is the key that I have to use to get in at work and I don't like it. <laughs> so I'm getting another chip so I don't have to carry this anymore. Um, yes, Dangerous Things is a great place to start. And, and even if you're not sure, they, they have... Uh, a wealth of information. The other thing I really want to call out too is all of the code that I use as, as well as some instructions um, I've put up on GitHub minus of course my my keys um, so if, if you are interested in kind of going the the hacky route or integrating it into something with with a microcontroller um, it's all here even even the little Mario song code so <laughs> All you have to do, really, as long as you wire, wire things up the same way, are put the bytes for your keys into one of these arrays. Some keys, the cheaper keys, they're only four bytes. Um, but the, the chip that you'd get from Dangerous Things is seven bytes. So it'd go down, down in here. Yeah? So earlier you mentioned like you didn't want things connected to the internet for like, your IoT stuff. Uh huh. And yep. RFID is also a radio. Um, so, yeah. There's not really a practical difference between those, other than maybe you buy like a Smart Things Hub, which is connected to the internet, but there's lots of open source things like OpenHAB and, and uh, Home Assistant where you can do a lot of this stuff without needing to connect it to the internet. Yeah, so, so with, with stuff like Zigbee and, and, you know, there are going to be some things that overlap and will pick up on the signal potentially, um, but they're probably not actually going to process that in any way that actually manifests it out onto the Internet, um, especially with the range in this chip. I don't expect any bleed over there. Um, but also don't, just don't go with Zigbee or... or those sorts of solutions for, for home. They're vulnerable to all sorts of stuff. Replay attacks. Someone can just uh, use an antenna to pick up the signal that you, you use on your on the way out and then play that signal again as you, after you leave and get in your door. Um, they also found a way to actually hack in and uh, because it's an inductive load with, with what they're using, uh, uh, turn it on and off fast enough that it'll catch fire. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, do do some research at DEF CON. <laughs> yes. For uh, for FC, uh, what, what's 
I assume mm -hmm. with, uh, you being able to update that uh, data repeatedly. Um, yes. There's some sort of lifetime some sort of ha well, maybe or lifespan. Probably at some point, but uh, it, or they, ghosting, the, like they could um, read. What's the security around those? Like uh, you got some sort of password that lets you update it, or so there's no security on the NFC okay. partition of your chip. Um, if someone can touch it, someone can read it. Um, right. So it's up to you what you put on there. And so, right. so like I said, I just I have. Right oh, right. Um, yeah. You can set up right security on it. Um, and that's that's. Uh, and can you set up right security on a passive one? That is yeah. a good question. <laughs> I don't believe so. Um, what I will say is they are uh, <coughs> they are putting more uh, putting a lot more effort into developing this technology, and they're they're trying to put more functionality into the chips. So um, I'd imagine if if it's not something we see today, it's something we might see tomorrow. Yeah. What's the failure rate on these? How like. How certain can you be that it's not going to fail in your hand? Ah, yeah. So, big bold letters on the store page. Try, try it before you, you know, and uh, scan it while it's in the syringe, not in your hand. Uh. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, after you assume it works, but what's, like, the, the failure rate that, like, just, you know, after a year they stop working? Or do they oh. have stats on that? Is it not really that I've seen. They're... Don't. There's really not a lot to go wrong. They're they're pretty solid state. Um, so so as long as you don't, they're not dead on arrival. They should be long lived. Yeah. The, the frequency the the chip responds to is that the same frequency range as used by the RFID is used in stores or say your driver's license or is it a different range? Uh, different range, different chips, different. Um, so different applications, uh, retail, they, they, they opt for more range. Um, so they go lower frequency, um, and they're typically cheaper. Um, and you can make them incredibly small, even the passive ones. So uh, one, one company is even making, making some chips that are, they, they look like tiny little specks of confetti. And they're putting those into things like engine blocks. So they're like painting them into the enamel inside the whole engine block. So if someone like stole a car, they could, you know, take off the VIN, you know, redo the body, everything else. But you tap anywhere on that engine block and you can tell what it originally came out of. Um, Does the engine block act as an antenna or something? No, no, no. Uh, there's just little teeny tiny passive chips all over it. Oh, wow. But they're so small, you can you can make a bunch with the same ID on them, and then uh, just in the yeah, just sprinkle them everywhere. <laughs> so how do you get how do you get your phone to be able to read? Ah. Is it an app or is it something you have to have? Dangerous Things has an app that gets you started. Um, the other most common app is called NFC Tools, and there's a companion app to that called NFC Tasks. So Tools will let you read. Um, and write to your chip and, and all of that good stuff. Uh, tasks will let you uh, expound upon that and link it to other things like unlocking your phone or putting your Wi-Fi uh, credentials on there, that kind of stuff. You don't need a hardware change to the phone to recognize? Nope. Scan Every it? modern phone, except for yours, <laughs> uh, has, has an NFC antenna built into it. Uh, and mostly what people use use it for today is, is tap to pay. But again, it works if you're close enough. Hello, Linux Fest. So I just have it trigger a voice to text app that I put on there. Yeah. Awesome. One more? Not any that I'd be alive <laughs> to witness. <laughs> uh, 
No, no, no. It, it works just as well, uh, you know, on the odd day that, that uh, Bellingham sees snow, uh, or I'm up at Mount Baker as, as the hottest day. Uh, yeah, you'd have to get. You might not scan me after I'm dead at the bottom of the Arctic, but. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I hope I helped squelch any fears that you guys had, or, or at least you know gave you gave you some places to look at or start. Um, feel free.